Peter Jackson, the pride of New Zealand, the film director who has spent eight years of his life making Lord of the Rings, joins me for a conversation about the making of the movie. It has led to a number of Academy Award nominations, including Best Picture and Best Director. I am pleased to have Peter Jackson with me in Los Angeles. Tell me this. Three films completed. Mm -hmm. Oscar nomination, Golden Globe winner. Mm -hmm. How do you feel? How is this, what does all this mean <laughs> for Peter Jackson? Uh, well, I sort of, I, I, I feel like I'm in the middle of something that's going to be once in a lifetime. I mean, I keep, every day I keep realizing, you know, enjoy it, enjoy it, because this is probably never going to happen again. And so I am trying to enjoy it. I'm, I'm also, you know, I'm also um, in pre-production on our next movie now. King Kong. Kong. Yeah, so I'm kind of eager, I've got itchy fingers to want to get stuck into that. <laughs> That's well. interesting because that was a project you were thinking about before you launched into yeah. Lord of the Rings. Yeah, yeah, no, that's right. It says we've come back to King Kong. We, it was my favorite movie. It is my favorite movie. And influenced you as a kid. Loved it, yeah. I just loved the, um, the escapism and, and, and the adventure. And I loved the emotional story where you, know, you cry when Kong falls off the Empire State Building. So I, um, I, I wanted to do Kong about um, seven or eight years ago. And we started working on it with Universal for about six or eight months. And then they pulled the plug on Kong. They just stopped it. It was one of those kind of like really uh, terrible, terrible days when we had to go in and tell everybody that was working because we were in pre-production um, that it wasn't happening anymore. But fortunately, at that time, we had Lord of the Rings kind of in the wings. Um, Harvey Weinstein was, was working at getting us the rights. And we were going to, supposed to be doing Kong first. But it, as it was, we were able to switch on onto Lord of the Rings. And of course, now... We've learned so much from Lord of the Rings that we're rewriting our Kong script. We've thrown our old script right out the door and we're rewriting it all and it's now going to be a lot better film. So, so I mean, fate, I, I really believe in fate. Fate's been kind to us. Because you had once said that after Lord of the Rings you would never again do anything this big. No. And it doesn't get any bigger than this. No, no. But you're doing something that's big, that's also fantasy, that's mm. also spectacle. Mm. So you jumped from the frying pan into the fire. <laughs> I did that on purpose. Well, why, well the, the main reason is because I love King Kong and Universal gave us an opportunity now after Lord of the Rings to go back to King Kong, which, which I wanted to do because it was very much unfinished business. It's a, it's a, a film I love to make. Um, and we also thought that straight after Lord of the Rings was the best time because it's effectively in the infrastructure that we have in New Zealand that becomes like a fourth Lord of the Rings film because everybody can just go straight into Kong and we don't have to lose yeah. lose anyone. We have such a great team down there. But if we started so doing you're a smaller... make this in New Zealand too? Yeah. 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 <laughs> well, we've set, up, we've set up studios, special effects places, sound yeah. mixing stages. I mean, and we've got it all down there at the moment, so... This is a, I mean, Kong is a great project. My guess is that, that uh, when Universal came and said, now we're ready to do King Kong, mm. Now that you've done Lord of the Rings, mm. to get Peter, mm. it's a very different story now in terms of Lord of the Rings has been so phenomenally successful mm. that to have you on the project is very different than having you on the project before Lord of the Rings. Well, not really. I mean, I didn't have to think about it particularly. I mean, when they said, were you interested in doing King Kong? I said, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it was actually that quick. I, we didn't really play any funny games with them. I mean, I, I, it is a film I want to make. I've, I've wanted to make, make it for years. I actually tried to make King Kong when I, when I was about um, 10 or 11 years old. I, I, I've got at home in New Zealand, I've got a cardboard model I made at the top of the Empire State Building, and I have a rubber King Kong, who now is like decomposing quite badly. Yeah. I, I got my mother's fur coat, um, and, I, and I trimmed off all the hair with scissors, and I glued it just, just little <laughs> clumps at a time onto this rubber King Kong, and I, I started doing some animated shots of King Kong on the Empire State Building, and I thought, I mean, I had this grandiose idea when I was 10 years old that I'd remake Kong and Super 8 in my, in my bedroom, <laughs> and so I hardly got anything done, but uh, so I've, I've been a long held dream of mine. Boy, it really is part of your legend now that when you were eight years old, you got that Super 8 camera, yeah. and you started making movies immediately. Yeah, yeah, well we got it for, you know, home movie use for family and for weddings and for holidays, but uh, I just loved, uh, I, I loved... Um, the fact that, because I've been making models I, I, ever since I was you know, five or six years old, I've been making little cardboard models of spaceships and things, and monsters, rubber monsters, and I love the idea that I could now get my little camera and I could film them and make up stories. And uh, 
and tell stories. And then, because I, I originally wanted to do special effects, that was what my real dream was. And um, King Kong, seeing that movie when I was nine years old, also fueled this desire to want to do effects. And then, as I started filming all my little effects and I went through my teenage years, I started to become more interested in stories and characters and, and thinking about the camera angles. And I slowly realized that being a director and a writer was really what, what my love was. Everybody who's been associated with Lord of the Rings, the three chapters yeah. that you tell, says to me, what made this possible was Peter's passion. Yeah. That you brought together people, you created a family in your own home country, yeah. New Zealand. Yeah. Uh, you worked harder than anybody else. Uh, it took you eight or nine years. Yeah. Tell me about that. <laughs> <laughs> the, passion, the passion and the sense of what you knew had to do. I mean, it's unbelievable. Well, I'm... I'm Nine years out of yeah, a person's yeah, life. Yeah, yeah. You know, your parents died mm -hmm. during this experience. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, you're older. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a big chunk of your life. Yeah. Um, I, I just woke up every morning loving what I was doing. <laughs> I mean, I'm still a kid. I'm still a kid with a camera. I haven't changed, and I'm one of those very, very fortunate people that get to to do their hobby a, as a profession. And I, I, my hobby is filmmaking, um, and I love what I'm doing. And Lord of the Rings is such a great story. You get inspired by the story that you're telling, and you know the experience of reading the book is, is just a, the book so imaginative and it, and it immediately puts images in your mind of what a movie could be like i mean i think any good novel probably does that that, that you, you're you're running your own private movie inside your head when you read the book when you read it and you were thinking of i was thinking someone else was going to make the movie because i read it when i was 17 i never ever dreamt that i'd do it i, I read it and thought wow this will, this will be pretty good a cool film when somebody makes it <laughs> and i was and, and i you know when you're 17 years old and i wasn't a professional filmmaker then i was actually a photo engraver at a, at a newspaper um and you know I, I i never dreamt that i'd be doing it i mean you know i i can't say that i read it and said well one day well, i will make this film because it wasn't like that i, I just thought somebody else would make it and it wasn't it was like a passing of 17 or 18 years. Why had it never by. been made? I mean, Saul Zanitz, I think, owned it. On yeah, the right yeah, side, he didn't have the English patient, which he mm -hmm. had to be rescued, or, in fact, you know, Harvey mm -hmm. came in to help him yes. finance the English patient, yes. and therefore yes. they had some obligation back and forth between the two of them. Yeah, well, Saul had the rights, and he'd made the animated film, um, the animated version of Lord of the Rings, which was the only way that people could conceive of doing it 20 years ago. Uh, uh, it, it, I mean, it hadn't been made because you, you, there was no way that you could put on film everything that Tolkien was describing. And with something, with a, with a title and a property like Lord of the Rings, I think you really have to be very careful that you don't make a disappointing film because so many people are, are, are passionate about the book. And if you're, if you're naming something Lord of the Rings, you've got a responsibility to deliver something that, that's deserving of that title. And you, you couldn't do it before the computer technology came in a few years ago. It just couldn't be done. How did you approach taking liberties with the story? You added characters and the women in Lord of the, mm -hmm. uh, the Rings. Mm -hmm. There's, I mean, there's some female characters, but they're not that. They're not what Tolkien's really yeah, interested yeah, in. I think they're noted in the appendices, aren't they? Yeah, yeah. And I mean, I uh, you know, the Miranda Otto character is obviously a key character in the books, and, and so we. Pretty much did the same. Yeah, right, right. We, we, we adapted her character pretty, pretty faithfully. Um, we, I, I mean, the way that we approached the screenwriting, because that was the real nightmare of this project. I mean, the script writing was the hardest thing that, that, that we ever did in, in the film. Now, was that your wife? It was Fran Walsh right. and Philippa Boynes and myself, yeah. And it was um, just the decisions that we had to make and the way that we told the story. We, we, we first of all we stripped it down to the bare spine of the story. We said, okay, this is about a little hobbit called Frodo Baggins who yeah. takes a ring and throws it in the <laughs> volcano yes. at the end. Yeah. Everything that is not to do with Frodo taking the ring will lose. Yes. So that 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 because Tolkien obviously went on off on tangents in all directions. So that sort of got rid of a lot of um, material that wasn't connected. And then we had to we had to shape it into three movies, which was kind of hard because we, we wanted I, I really wanted each film to obviously be a enjoyable film by itself because they were being released one year apart. There was no you know, when the first film came out it was just the first film. But I also knew that this moment would arrive which we're 
here today where the three of them would exist and there's, in people's minds they'd blend into one long story. So I wanted that to also work. So we, we had to sort of shape the, the arcs of the story individually for three movies and then as a, as a much greater kind of um, 10 hour or 11 hour long piece at the end. Um, we, we made up a lot of scenes. We, if, if, if something wasn't in the book that we needed, we felt we needed, like there's a, there's a key sequence in The Return of the King where, um, where we just wanted to have a moment of real conflict between Frodo and Sam that Gollum creates. And so there's a moment that, that Frodo tells Sam to go home. He's, he, he's, Sam has been helping Frodo all this way. And Frodo says, I don't need you anymore, Sam. I don't want you, just go. And, and that's not in the book, that scene. We, we, we felt we wanted to have that moment in the story. So, we, you know, if it wasn't there, we, we created it. We, we, also, um, we also felt that we were making the films for people that read the books 10 years ago, not, not 10 weeks ago. So we thought we must make sure everything that somebody remembers from the experience of reading this book a few years ago. I'm we not sure I've seen it. So we wanted to somebody who read it 10 years ago and somebody who read it the, you, your, your memory of the detail has gone, So, but, but you remember key images in your mind that really jump out from the book. And you want to make sure you would those We had images. all of those images. So, so everybody who has a memory of reading Lord of the Rings you know, a few years ago, the films have the things that you remember. But we weren't, we weren't interested in being faithful to, to the detail because that's not our job. I mean, our job is, is to make movies. We, we, it was our primary responsibility. And everything you needed to make a great movie was there. Oh, that's a fantastic story, yeah. And, everything. you know, and, and, well, I'll tell you what the key thing with Tolkien is, and, and we did spend some time, obviously, at the very beginning, thinking, OK, we're making these films. What, what is it about the books that people have loved for 40, 50 years? Because there's a secret to it. You know, there, there's like a key to it, and we, we wanted to know what that key was. And, and, and the one thing that we realised is that even though Tolkien has the battles and he has the monsters and he has everything, kind of all the, all the fantastical elements... What you love, what what people love about those books, and what draws them back to read them over and over again, are the characters. It, it, it's the characters. It's the hobbits. It's the courage. It's the bravery, friendship. It's the characters. And so that gave us a real strong um, sense at the very beginning that we had to make our film. We had to we had to balance the films and weight them to the wards of and, characters. And just to make sure the presence of the characters was central yeah, to the story. Yeah, not allowing, not getting carried away by all this incredible trickery and and, and, and these visuals that we had. Just, just always coming back to those characters, and and we, we wanted to try to have the films retain that same balance of the books. We didn't want to skew it in a, in a different way to what Tolkien did. Lots of people want to read into Tolkien, and now you, mm. everything into this. Yeah. I mean, it is. Some people say a defense of Western civilization. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they look in terms of conflict, whether it's the Iraqi war and, and invasions and this yep. and that. Do you see any of that? Well, well, I mean, you can if you choose to. I think that's one of the great things about cinema is that people are allowed, you know, should be allowed to interpret whatever they want. But I don't think Tolkien was was um, Tolkien wasn't writing about the contemporary political situations. Obviously, he wrote the books. He wrote the Lord of the Rings uh, from the late thirties into the into the late forties. I mean, he wrote the books through World War Two, but even then, I don't think he was really writing about World War Two. Right. Um, it's timeless, you know. His themes are not they're not um, politically based. They're they're, they're you know they're themes. But Shakespeare's timeless too, and he did write about. Oh well, I think everybody writes about their life experience. I mean, Tolkien Tolkien as an author was obviously reflecting the person he was, and, and the person you are is based on experiences. And there's no doubt that there's no doubt that some of the things that Tolkien was writing were based on his experiences in the trenches in the, the First World War. Um, he saw all of his he, he saw all but all but one of his um, childhood friends die in, in the First World War. People he'd gone to school with. Um, he knew what it was like to return home from war, um, to have gone through this horrific experience and to come home and not to be able to talk about it, not to be able to, you can't talk to your wife or your children about what you experience. It's just not, not appropriate. They don't understand and they never will. And, and that was actually a real clue to us about how to end the return of the king because we wanted, once the ring was destroyed, I really wanted to have Frodo and the Hobbit's homecoming um, and their experience of going back to their homeland to, to reflect what it would be like to come back from a war. Because I knew that, I, I felt very strongly that that's what Tolkien had in his mind from his own life experience. What was the most emotional scene for you to film? 
Um, well, I, I mean, the scene where I was, <laughs> I was crying on the yeah. set, had tears in my eyes, was when um, Sam picks up Frodo onto his shoulders and says, "I can't, I can't carry the ring." for you Mr Frodo but I can carry you and um, we shot that on the side of a volcano in New Zealand a real volcano an actual active volcano and it was at the end of the day and it was one of those situations where the light was kind of going down and we, were, we had to move quite quickly and we only got three takes we only we shot the, the entire sequence of Sam cradling Frodo um, in three three takes and I couldn't I didn't even have time to shoot different angles on Sean Elijah so I had to have one camera one camera pointing at, at Elijah lying on the ground being cradled and I had to have another camera at the same time pointing at Sam because uh, uh, um, so, I was just running out of time and we got three takes and by the third take they, the guys had delivered the goods and I, I had tears down. This not only has your passion but it was an emotional commitment that was... Mm. It's, it's an emotional commitment because you it consumes your life and um, it's such an intense experience to make a movie. You, you literally, I mean, you don't have a, a life, really. And Fran and I just tried to, um, we tried to, to raise two ch children all the way during this process. Um, and so it was really, everything outside of the movie was focused on our kids um, because they, they needed the hours and the hours of the week that we, could, we, we had spare. Um, we devoted it to them. And You're an only child. Yep. Does that, and I'm an only child. Right. Do you think we, only children, somehow live in fantasy more than we create our own world because we have no brothers and sisters? And, mm -hmm. and I grew up in a small, rural, small town. Mm -hmm. You grew up in a place that's not overpopulated. populated. 900 people. So you create your own world. Yeah, yeah. I think, I think the, your imagination is something that you can exercise when you're young. And I think the more you exercise it, the bigger your imagination will get and the more vivid. And, and I think that possibly only children fall back on their imagination much more so than than if you have a, a, a larger family um, because you're not you're not playing with other kids a lot of the time you're not interacting and, and you're not just responding to what somebody else is doing you're obviously in a solitary world and you just think you dream you dream you imagine i mean i spent hours and hours um as a child just imagining movies and i've always imagined movies that were way too ambitious for what I could ever do, but I just get excited about them and then I would try to make something and it would never be quite as good as I wanted. But you yeah, your mind your mind is like a muscle, you know, your imagination. You just the more you exercise it and, and as an only child you're forced to do that. You also lucky in that your parents supported the idea of your dream, your passion, your fantasy. Mm -hmm. I mean, you could not have had more supportive no, very, very, very important. Very In important. Everyone? Very important. And as a parent now myself, I, it's, some, it's a lesson, possibly the the most potent lesson that my that, that I've gained from my parents is to support your children in whatever they want to do. I mean, my two my two parents didn't have any interest in film or drama. They were very straightforward people. They they immigrated from England to New Zealand um, after World War Two. And and I was my interests and my hobbies were just so removed from what they had experienced or what they were interested in. But they were there for me all the time, always supporting me. They they would they would buy me a new movie camera for for Christmas when I was fourteen years old. I wanted a better camera, and they would buy one for me. And I didn't get a I didn't have my driver's license till I was in my twenties um, because I was too busy making films and I was a sort of nerdy <laughs> nerdy type guy. And, um, <laughs> and so mum and dad would drive me around to, to yeah. film things in the weekends and they devoted so yeah. much of their time to, to helping me. And um, there's a story where she created some of the vomit that you were using for one of your... Yeah, yeah. One, of, one of my spreader films, mum would make the vomit. In fact, on my second movie, Meet the Feebles, it was such a low budget that we couldn't afford a caterer, so mum would make pies and and and, and, um, and lasagnas and things, and she'd bring, bring them in, and we'd feed the crew with, with mum's cooking. Did she... I don't remember when they died. I know they both died. I think yeah. he died first, did he? Dad, Dad died when we were in pre-production in 98, and then mum... Mum didn't quite get to see the Fellowship of the Ring, the first film. She did. she actually died three days before we before we finished the film. She was sort of hanging on. She had Parkinson's and, and, and was very old and frail and was sort of slowly slowly going downhill over over the, the a year or two. And um, she was sort of hanging on to see the movie and, and she died three days before it was finished. And we actually played it at her funeral. 
uh, we, we had her funeral. I had all my relations there, all my family, um, you know, extended family, and, and, and so I took them all into a theatre on um, the afternoon of the funeral and played played the, the movie. And I said, "Listen, Mum would, Mum would love the idea of that this was being played at her played at her funeral. That was the first ever showing of 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 the uh, Fellowship of the Ring. The first time it ever got seen." Now that it's over, now that it's so enormously successful commercially, artistically, in terms of the judgment of your peers and all these nominations, um, what did you learn from doing it this way, from making this movie about? Would you do it the same way if you were doing it over? Or do you say... <laughs> the idea of doing it over horrifies me. <laughs> so I'm very happy to do it once. <laughs> but, um, but then the question is, if you had known how hard it was going to do, would it, would it have... Restrained you from doing it? I don't know. That's a very, that's a very interesting question. That one. No, no because look, I, look, I, I love being a filmmaker, yeah. and Lord of the Rings is just like what better thing yeah. to make. Um, no, no, I, I um, you, you learn. I mean, every time you step onto a film set, every day you're going to film school. Uh, you know, every day there's things to learn, and I, and, and often it's intangible. I mean, I've come out of Lord of the Rings with a huge confidence um, that I possibly didn't have going into it. And, and, and I'm in an interesting situation because back in 1996 we were making King Kong and now in 2004 we've resumed making King Kong again and I just remember being so overwhelmed by the logistics in 1996 being so having endless meetings around board tables of how do we do this how are we going to get this shot this is a really difficult thing to do how are we going to do it but having gone through Lord of the Rings now a lot of those problems have naturally been solved and they're things that we understand the systems are in place and the experience of, of approaching King Kong now I mean the, the writing is always the hardest as it always is to, to get that script right but the logistical side of King Kong seems Relatively simple now compared to you what Lord of the Rings you could do. King Kong. I think I think I think that applies to everybody that's been in the Lord of the Rings cast and crew. Is that we've made three huge movies all at the same time, and anything we ever do in our careers again is in some way going to be easier than, than doing that. Yeah, you can remember that meeting when Bob Shea said, "Why not three? Oh yeah, <laughs> oh yeah. That was a that was a, that was a moment, moment, significant moment in time. Yeah. Yeah. You knew that you could do it the way you wanted to do. Yeah, well, it was fantastic. How do you think Lord of the Rings Beyond You will change movie making? I I hope it um, I hope it inspires and influences young kids. Um, I mean, the the greatest thing that that I could ever imagine with Lord of the Rings would be in, in twenty or thirty years time. Um, is to have some film, a filmmaker come up to me and say, I'm, I'm only making films because I saw Lord of the Rings when I was nine years old. I mean, I'm only making films because I saw King Kong when I was nine years old. And, and the thought that you're, you're doing something that inspires the next generation, because that's important for filmmaking. It's important to raise the bar. It's important to keep improving the standards of films because then everybody gets goes along and everybody has to lift their game. Um, you know, I... I I've, it was, it was sort of interesting because um, I, I think to some degree a lot of these films that are coming out this year and next year like you know Troy and Alexander and um, Ridley Scott's making a big Crusader film at the moment I'm sure they're going to in some ways I mean they'd be, be certainly they're going to realise that their battle scenes have to be bigger than ours <laughs> otherwise people will be disappointed so it's kind of like the, you know, yeah. but it's like this is what Spielberg did with Saving Private Ryan I mean that amazing D-Day beach right. landing that, that, anybody making a war film from that moment forward has a standard that they have to reach, and that's the great thing about. And the standard was the reality and the power, yeah, the, of power the, the fear film. that was on that beach. Yeah, which is all to do with the skill of the filmmaking, and and that standard now has influenced all war films brain. that have been made since. And that's uh, you know that's a great thing about cinema is that you just it's, it's continually raising the bar. You, all you the stand time. on the shoulders of people who've come yeah, before you in a significant way. Yeah. When you were making this, um, did you? Did you know, I mean, was it a film in which, because you were doing it the way you did, uh, that you knew somehow it was all coming together? Or were there moments of powerful doubt in which you said, why did I ever think I could do you, this? You never have a clue. You fly blind the whole time. I mean, you don't know. You, you, it's impossible at any point, at any point when you're doing this, whether you're script writing or whether you're in the middle of shooting on set, it's impossible to flash forward two years and get a snapshot of what the finished film is going to be like because it's so organic and there's so many people contributing to it and, and it's evolving all the time. 
Um, you, you only just have to keep you, you have to keep your standards as high as possible and just keep your fingers crossed. And there's always a, there's a horrible point where, which is the, the time that you see the first assembly of the movie. So in other words, you've finished shooting and the editor has put together the shots that you've shot. He's just whacked them all together and, and it's really rough and it's long and it's all over the place and there's no special effects either of course at this point it's, it's, and, and you look at that and you come away almost convinced that you've possibly made the worst film of all time Return of the King uh, when everything comes together mm -hmm. you have created your characters you have mm -hmm. placed them in the position for the payoff mm -hmm. yeah. uh, in the editing room was this the most satisfying film? It was the most satisfying film, I think, in order to make. And we even even when we were shooting the three movies at the same time, the Return of the King days uh, were always the most satisfying because you have to put yourself in the headspace of that particular movie. Even though yesterday you might have shot something from Fellowship of the Ring, yeah. today is the Return of the King day, so you're on set and you've got to think of, okay, well, where are we in the story? And, and, and I always like the momentum of Return of the King. I always like, as a filmmaker, the feeling that we were now the climactic forces were all coming to, together. And I think the actors enjoyed the Return of the King days more too because it, it seemed more emotional, so it, it, it gave them a, a much greater challenge than um, some of the earlier stuff. And, uh, yeah, I, it, it, it was a tough film to edit, I mean, mainly because we had so much footage. You know, well, we, we had have hours to Well, it was four and a half at one stage. <laughs> <laughs> and, and getting it down from four and a half to something, you know, we were aiming for three hours-ish yeah. and we and we couldn't quite get there. We got to 320 <laughs> and... and, and it was, said, this is our film. That is our film, yeah. yeah. Now, was that your call? Did you have director's cut so that you could deliver them? Yeah, uh, con uh, contractually, I shared I share cut. With uh, Bob Shea at New, at New Line, we share it together. But, but at this Bob's, stage, we all Bob's been fine. He he always looks at the various versions as we're cutting them, gives us notes, and um, you know we, we take from the notes what we want. But they're often very very useful. We don't preview the, the, our, our movies, so we don't have a public preview. So you don't exactly you exactly. don't, 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 don't go to some just, focus group and say no, see how the audience reacts. No. So the notes from the studio, from Bob and from Mark Oleski and, and other people, are actually quite important to us because they are the only feedback that we we literally get. So we take um, heed of what, what they say, and um, and you end up just it's it's your instincts. It just becomes a very instinctive thing, and also you 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 end up you end up just making the film that you want to watch. You know, it actually is quite selfish at the end. It's quite self-indulgent because you stop... You, you, and I think it's very unhealthy to sudden, to think that you're making this film for other people because you can't second-guess what other people want. And I don't think that's a good approach. Um, you, you just end up falling back on yourself. And what, what version of Return of the King would I think was cool? You know, that's what you base all your, all your decisions on. What's been the most surprising joy of the casting? Well, I mean, I, I, for me, the I mean, the most, the greatest experience is just having all these new friends. Yeah, it was <laughs> family. It, it was family. It was fantastic. And you, you know, you turn up on the first day of shooting, and you're with strangers. I mean, you never met these people before. And, and at the end of it, you're just close friends. And uh, it's sad to feel it's come to an end from that point of view. But after what, I, nine years. Uh, well, with the yeah, actors, it's been the last five years, five really, years. We're, we're, we've been shooting. Um, but, you know, I just hope we can work together again. And we know we're always going to be friends. But um, and, and I also, the, the thing that the actors contributed to the project, which was the most important thing, was to give it a sense of reality, that none of them, none of them w was coming to work thinking we're making fantasy, we can be a little bit bigger than life, we can, you know, we, 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 we don't have to treat this seriously. It, 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 everybody's performance was based on reality, on, on, a, on a strength of real emotion, and that's that was just the perfect way to approach this film. There's, there's a real feeling of, of a sense of reality that the no matter what the world is and no matter what the visuals are, every character in these films believes utterly in the moment that they're, that, that they're living. Your first hire, for, uh, Elijah was first. Elijah was, he was early on. I mean, Elijah, um, Elijah cast himself in the film, really. Like showing you this documentary. Yeah, he sent us a tape, and that tape just showed up in the mail, and it was from Elijah Wood, who I never would have considered putting in the movie, to be quite honest. This is one of the great stories of casting. Yeah, well, we were in London. We thought that, uh, we thought that Frodo should be an English actor, um, because that's the nature of the character. So we, we'd seen about 200 young English actors, and then in the casting office, uh, this brown package shows up, and it was a VHS tape from Elijah Wood, 
who I've never actually seen in a Elijah Wood movie, even though I'm, I know he's been in films <laughs> yes. since he was a kid. So I didn't have a, a great image of what he looked like, and um, Fran said, oh, we actually, Elijah's got a really interesting face, we should, we should put the tape in. Um, otherwise I might not have even put the tape in. Because we didn't really think we would, we would, we would, we would go that way. And uh, Elijah had um, Elijah had heard we were, we were auditioning, but we weren't going to come to Los Angeles, um, so he had rented some costumes, some sort of hobbity costumes, gone up in the woods behind his house with a friend with a VHS camera. Um, and he'd filmed himself doing some passages from the book, you know, Frodo dialogue from the book. And he, we looked at this, and that, that moment, that, that, that second that we saw it, it was like, my God, he's great. And he, he that, it was his. He did it himself. <laughs> and he delivered. Yeah, oh, he's fantastic, yeah. And he Ian? Is, uh, Sir Ian. Serene McKellen. Serene McKellen almost wasn't he we, we met with him and we wanted him to be Gandalf he'd never read the books and so he, he was at a disadvantage because we were having to it's surprising he'd never read the books no, he's a, yeah, yeah that's right but anyway he hadn't and he and then we had all sorts of trouble with, with um, casting Ian because he was doing X-Men the original X-Men and uh and it was one of those fortuitous things because Ian actually called us after trying to figure out because X-Men was shooting it and it was going to run into the beginning of the Lord of the Rings shoot. It was going to overlap and, and we, couldn't, we couldn't get Ian away from X-Men and, and therefore we weren't going to be able to use him. We were going to have to start because we, we, we had built sets and we planned our shoot to start with Gandalf scenes at the very beginning. And then, so Ian had to, Ian phoned me one day and said, listen, people, I just can't do, do your film. I'm sorry, I'd love to do it, but I can't. And so this was a disastrous thing. And um, the following day, he went to a restaurant in London, and he bumped into Bob Shea at a restaurant in London. Another fate. Yeah. Fate yeah. was dealing us a kind hand. And Ian said, oh, I'm sorry, Bob, I've had to pass on, on, on your film. And, and Bob said, but we want you, we want you. We, how, how do we make you do it? And, and, and Ian said, well, I can't, the first three months of Lord of the Rings, I can't, I can't do, do it because I'm going to be doing, doing, doing X-Men. I'm going to miss that first three months. And so Bob Shea called us up and said, listen, whatever it costs, whatever you want to do, figure out shooting something else for the first three months and then having Gandalf join the team. And that way we can have Ian. And so Bob made it happen. He he wanted Ian so badly, and that restaurant meeting was kind of the best thing that could have happened. Did each of these actors, Sean, Andy, Ian, Bigo, Elijah, I'm forgetting, Liv, did they create the characters they you had in your mind? Because each of them created, yeah. they found a way. You know, you gave them wigs and you gave them a whole lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. And you gave them a script that had been thought through. Uh, but out of that, a director gives an actor direction, mm -hmm. but an actor is responsible for mm -hmm. giving back to you your yeah. vision in a way that goes beyond your vision. Yeah, no, sure. That was, and that, what, that, did, that did happen. I mean, they, they all... They all ended up portraying the characters in a way that was it was vivid and vibrant and goes beyond what you imagined at the beginning. Um, we we wanted we wanted our characters to feel like they stepped out of the pages of the book, and that's really why we didn't want to cast you know superstars in the roles because they come with previous baggage. We we wanted people that that read Lord of the Rings and loved Lord of the Rings to feel that they had come. Out of the book. I mean, it's why we we didn't we didn't even want Ian McKellen to look like Ian McKellen. I mean, we gave him a false nose Ian, in the movies. Ian's wearing a he's, Ian's wearing a rubber nose to try to give him more of a Gandalf sort of look. Um, and, and we you know we just wanted that feeling of authenticity. We wanted to go beyond being actors. And that's the most important standard that you you applied here. Is it how do we create maintain authenticity? Yeah, I mean authenticity. It, it starts with you wanting to generate huge emotion w with the characters. Like, for instance, in Return of the King, when audiences are seeing the movie and some people are crying and, and they're really investing in the characters, th that's the end result. That's what you want. But in order to achieve that, that in order to, to have people that committed to the movie that, that, that it causes them to cry, you, you have to make everything real before that. The world that the movie is set in has to be real. You know, Middle Earth has to feel like an authentic place the costumes have to feel real they can't feel fake if, if anything feels fake along the way you're not going to get that those tears at the end you just won't get it because people will not be believing they won't in what they're seeing the book no 
you've spent a lot of time, I think, maybe not, on the DVDs. Mm. I mean, these DVDs have everything. Mm. They have documentaries, mm. they have mm. appendices, they have mm. Peter introducing what's in the DVDs. Mm. Why do you so carefully spend so much time? You've made the movie. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I love it. I love DVDs. I, I, I'm a big DVD fan. I lo love collecting other people's DVDs. <laughs> and so the um, the fun of doing your own is just, just it's really cool. It's, uh, and I also, I mean, the thing with our DVDs, which possibly, uh, you know, I wouldn't do for any other films, is that because, it, because it's Lord of the Rings, which has such a huge fan base. I mean, these these extended DVDs are made just for fans. I mean, I'm not expecting yeah, yeah, anybody yeah, that yeah, doesn't really right. interest in Lord of the Rings to, to, to ever buy them. But you have to be a serious fan of Tolkien, or you have to be a serious fan of movie making. Yeah, and, and and so we have, you know, like like any movie, you shoot your film and you end up with footage that you don't use. And in our case, we've had just about an hour for each of the movies that we haven't put in, but that we filmed. Now, to me, that's that hour represents a legitimate adaptation of Tolkien's work. I mean, because we, we wrote, we scripted that hour's worth of footage that didn't make it into the film. We scripted that at the beginning as part of us adapting the books, and it's all material from the books. It's, it's, it's scenes with characters. It's things that we ultimately didn't think we needed in order to try to get the length of these films down. But nonetheless, they do form part of the greater adaptation of The Lord of the Rings. And if it wasn't Lord of the Rings, I probably wouldn't do it. But I just felt that that these scenes are perfectly good scenes. I mean, they're not like our worst scenes. Um, they're, they're sometimes, they're amongst our best scenes that for some reason we just don't and want to put in. Through the DVD. And I just felt that we should we should put this material back in so that fans who want to see a more fleshed out um, adaptation of Lord of the Rings um, can, can do that. As a director, have you changed because of this? Um, did you, you shoot a lot of scenes. I mean, you have a reputation as a guy who knows what he wants, mm. and he, he he has to feel it. Mm. And in other words, it may be shot, and you may not like it, and not know why you don't like it. It just didn't get to what you want, mm. and that's a feeling rather than. Yeah, I mean, I you know you you either know exactly what you want, or you pretend that you know what you want when you walk on set, uh, you know, I mean, th there were many days walking on set where I, especially towards the end of the shoot when I was getting very tired, because I, you know, it was a long shoot, it was f f 15 months of shooting, and um, exhaustion was certainly setting in towards the end, and I, 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 I some days I'd, I'd turn up on set, and, and, I, and I would just be going, oh my God, I, how do I make this good, how, how do I, and I'd be struggling, because my imagination was kind of drying up, it was like shriveling with exhaustion, and and at that point, I was really um, relying on the actors to do it for me because I, I it, you know, I, I can figure out where to put a camera. It may not be the most imaginative camera angle because I'm now unable to do that, but I would then rely upon the actors to deliver the goods, and they were always there for me. I mean, that's why I, it was such a great family atmosphere. As I think sometimes they even sense when I was exhausted, and, and they would, you know, help you put you on their shoulders yeah, and take you through yeah, the end of the scene. Sure, yeah. Uh, What's the working relationship between you and Freya? Um, the working relationship is um, its just really good. It's one of those great relationships where we can say anything to each other now. There's no boundaries, which is, which is good. It's honest, and, and, and it's, and it's um, genuine, and it's full of trust. I mean, Fran, I, I'm lucky in the sense that Fran and I have such similar sensibilities both as people, but also the fact that we're there at the very beginning writing these scripts. And so by the time we've gone through that process, we, we both of us know exactly what we're trying to achieve. We know why we wrote the scene. We know what the, the motivation is for that scene being in the movie. And, um, I mean, Fran would direct some scenes of, of, of Lord of the Rings. I mean, I was um, there were certainly moments when I was falling behind schedule because we had a really... We couldn't go o over um, schedule like in any film. It's a disaster if you do that from a budget point of view. And there'd be some days where you know you, you'd, you'd have a certain amount of that you have to shoot that week, and by Thursday, I'd be realising I'm not going to get through it all. And, and I'd say to Fran, "Listen, we've got we've got a spare camera, and we can we can we can strip off some of our crew to put a little little guerrilla team together, and, and could you go and shoot a scene for me?" And um, she 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 shot some stuff. She shot. Um, the scene of the two towers where Gollum and Schmeagol talk to each other 
that was something that Fran Schott, and she actually wrote that um, because she felt, we looked at the first edit of The Two Towers and we felt we didn't have a scene where where um, we really sold that schizophrenic kind of thing with Gollum and Schmeagel. We had it, we had it there, but it yeah. wasn't really nailed properly. A and so she sat down one night at home and she wrote this scene where he talks to himself and I said, well, this is a great scene, but I don't know how we're going to shoot it because there's no way I, I can fit it into the schedule I've got. Um, and and she, she so we, we found a way for her, her to shoot it. And so she, she shot that one. And so it, it's, it's a great support for me. It's, it's just, it's like another, you know, people often say to me, um, oh, well, wouldn't it be great if you could clone yourself, you know, and we could be, but in a sense, I don't have to because I've got Fran. <laughs> and it, and it, it, it doesn't affect the marriage at all except enhance it. It's, it, it helps it. I, I couldn't imagine what the experience of doing Lord of the Rings would have been like if I had a partner who didn't really wasn't understand what, well, wasn't invested in, in what we were doing, but also didn't understand the stresses involved. Because, you know, you'd come home in the evening wrung out because of something that had happened. And I, I think a lot of marriages don't survive in the movie industry on that basis that, that, that it's, that one world is so extreme in its pressure and it's, and it's tension, and then if the partner doesn't work in the film industry, it's just hard to, to reconcile the two together. But I, so I think actually having Fran working on the films is, is ultimately a very strong thing for our family. Did the kids want to have a role? Yeah, I mean, the kids have been in all three films. Yeah, they've grown up with these films. I mean, they were born at the very beginning, seven or eight years ago. I mean, our kids are seven and eight. And, um, and they and now that everything in their entire life has revolved around mummy and daddy doing <laughs> Lord of the Rings and now we're finally saying to them Lord of the Rings is over now, now we'll, we'll have a discussion about King Kong <laughs> <laughs> but, but yeah no, it's important for the kids we, we've always tried to take the kids to work when, if, if we're working on a Saturday you know, or, or a Sunday we try to bring them to where they sit on the set I mean Billy's great at sitting there playing Game Boy or something yeah. you know you find film, they find films it's very boring yeah, well, yeah. Yeah. Boring. But uh, but the one thing with with my kids that made me laugh was um, and, and I thought God this really this shows that our kids do do have a you know a healthy view of what the film is really because they have their little action figures you know the little yeah. toys um, that like most kids have they they love playing with those toys except um, normally a, a kid would say okay and Arwen's galloping on her horse and they'd have the, the horse there and, and Aragorn comes over and she jumps off and all this. And, and, but our kids say, and, and here comes Liv, and Vigo's coming up, and, and Liv's jumping off the horse. They, they use the actors' real names when they're playing with the toys yeah. rather, rather than the characters' names. <laughs> Speaking of the actors, uh, you got an Academy, you got a Golden Globe, you received the Golden Globe for Best Director, yeah. the picture won for Best yeah. Picture. Yeah. Uh, you've got those nominations for the Academy Award. Yeah. The actors aren't nominated. No, no. No, I, I think it's um, well, yeah, uh, I, you know, I mean, obviously the great actors are nominated. This great actors nominated. So it's a, co it's a competition, unfortunately. It's one of those situations where you're, you know, film filmmakers and actors are forced into this sort of this competitive environment. Um, yeah, I, I was disappointed. Um, I was disappointed. I think particularly for Sean Astin, who who I think you know had done the most incredible performance of his career. Um, but you know, I. I all around the world, Lord of the Rings is playing in cinemas at the moment, Return of the King, and, and Sean's making people cry every day. What is it about his character? And so I just think that's that's his art, that's his craft. You know, it's not it's not about it's not the awards really. And he really created a character. Gollum is Gollum. Yeah, well, Gollum's his interesting. His I voiced it. Yeah, I mean, Andy did such an incredible job at creating this character. Obviously, you know, animators helped and and, and CG yeah. people, but. That, contrib that 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 acting contribution on and from from Andy towards that character is something that is quite unique, and you know it's not surprising that um, from an award point of view and a nomination point of view, it's been very hard to sure. to to categorise what that contribution actually is and where it goes in. Um, you know, last year for Two Towers, we won the Oscar for Best Visual Effects, and and I think you know a substantial amount of that was, was people honouring the achievement of. Of, of, of Gollum, and so from that point of view, um, that, that was Andy was was, 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 was re rewarded in that way. Why is it important to you, this Oscar business? 
Well, I um, I mean, uh, an Oscar is obviously, uh, you know, it's it's a tradition of Hollywood going back to 1927. I mean, Wings was the first movie, silent movie, that won won the first Oscar. And so, as a as a filmmaker, even as a little kid in New Zealand, you know, Oscars mean something. And I always it used to watch them on TV. It's a judgment of your peers, and it's a sort of it's a um, it, it's something that's just a traditional thing in the film industry. It's not an award that's been born out of a, out of a TV show or, or um, groups of people wanting to sort of, you know, get publicity somehow. This is traditional old Hollywood, and obviously it's a, it's a huge achievement. I mean, the nominations we're incredibly proud about. I mean, the Oscars are so... Are, are, are so prestigious in a way, and 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 the fact that five thousand people are voting for them, that the nominations themselves are almost as good as an award. I mean, they're 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 a huge honor. The notion that you'll never do anything as big as this before, probably, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, that you've spent the you're about forty, I assume, forty two, yeah. Uh, that you have spent a good eight, nine, ten years of your life mm -hmm. thinking about this and doing this, mm -hmm. um, and that it may be your best work. Mm -hmm. That your best work may be behind you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, you know, I, I don't think I'm ever going to do anything as big as this. I don't think I'm going to do anything that 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 gets this incredible swell of sort of public interest because we we're riding obviously in this sort of experience, unique experience of having shot three films at the same time, releasing them one year apart. So there's this incredible momentum that is sort of affecting everything, um, and that's probably never going to happen again. Uh, it's just, you know, one film at a time from this point on, and that's, that's good for Can me. you think of no uh, other great epic that you would say, that's for me? The story is so powerful. Not, not that I'm willing, willing to give not, another seven years. Not at my own, no. Something may, something may, I may get to go to a bookstore tomorrow and, and find something I like, but um, not, not at the moment, no. But, you know, the hard, the, the hard thing that when you're a filmmaker, the, the, the thing that is the most difficult thing, which does not go away after Lord of the Rings, um, is to make a good film. That I Anything you attempt to make is going to be either good, bad, or somewhere in the middle. And you're always horrified that you're going to make a bad film. You're always hoping you're going to make a good film. And that's what I'm just going to continue to do. I'll, I'll continue making films about things that interest me and try to make the best possible films I can. You set out to get inside Torkin's head, mm. right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we, we wanted, wanted to know what it is. We, we wanted to make films that he would like. You know, we wanted to make them for the same reasons that he wrote the book. We wanted we wanted the films to to care about the things that he cared about. You know, we didn't we, we particularly didn't want to put any of our own baggage into the film. Because people say, in part, because it's such a achievement, this is Peter Jackson's Lord of the Rings. Well, it's an, it's an interpretation. It's somebody else taking the Lord of the Rings and saying and being a fan. I mean, it's 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 a it's a fan making the movie. There's no way you can watch this movie and not say Peter Jackson. Is a huge fan. No, I mean I, any filmmaker in the world would make a completely different film. I mean, you know, you could take five or six filmmakers, give them Lord of the Rings to make, and it would be fascinating to see what uh, you know. But they'd all, they'd all be different films because so so sure. This is this is this is me as a fan reading the book. Um, as you read the book, you have this this these images in your head of what things look like, which are your private images, not shared with anyone else. There, there you have a sense of the story of the excitement. You can almost hear a kind of music playing. I mean, I can when I read a book. You, you get swept away and, you know, you just get to be this incredibly lucky person who somehow gets this money to go out and, and, and try to transfer what's in your head as a result of reading the book and, and put it onto screen. So suddenly everybody else is looking at the movie and it may not be it may not be what was in their head, but they're sort of getting a little idea of what's in my head and my collaborator, the collaborators who have... Of input, it's like we the, people are looking at somebody else's imaginative um, uh, vision of what Lord of the Rings is t is to them. And Lord of the Rings is to you. It's just it's a wonderful escapist piece of entertainment. It goes back to what I it's liked about that, though, King Kong. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, it's are we all reading too much into it? It's not just a bit of escapist entertainment. I mean, we're you I mean, they're all this sort of the history of you know. Well, Tolkien. I mean, Tolkien was pa passionate. He was passionate about a lot of things. I mean, Tolkien was a fairly 
by all accounts, a fairly irritable old yeah, exactly. professor who got annoyed about things. <laughs> and I actually think a lot of the motivation for putting stuff yeah. in Lord of the Rings was his annoyance. Yeah. Uh, he, was a, he, he hated the idea that the English countryside had been chopped down, chopped down, forests had been cut down, factories had been built in the industrial age. He hated the idea that, that, um, that satellite towns were built around the factories, all these terraced housing, and the workers were enslaved to the, to the factory. And every morning you went in and every night you came out, and that was your life. And, and that, that is a, a lot of what Lord of the Rings is about, is about his hatred of enslavement, of, of, of everybody serving the machine. He thought the internal combustion engine was the greatest evil that had ever been visited upon this world. That we sit, even we sit in our car and we are slave to our car. We don't have a free will. We have to go where the car is allowed to go. We can't just wander. He, he was, you know, he was a sort of a Luddite type character. And, um, and you get a feeling that he was profoundly annoyed by a lot of things. And that, that, that fueled his energy yeah, at, everything. at writing. Yeah, I mean, it took him 14 years to write this book. He was being driven by something, and I'm sure he was being driven by his passionate dislike of a lot, a lot of um, a lot of things that he'd seen visited upon the world, both natural things about enslavement to factories, wars. Um, he he put it all in the books, and so we we tried to make the films honor those themes, those passions of his. You said this. Um, and you can look back on it now. The fear of failure is one of the most powerful creative forces at work. A director has many duties. One of them is to be calm. In an organization as big as we had with 2,000 people working over a long period of time, if the director started to unravel, the entire thing would fall apart mm -hmm. like a house of cards. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The fear of failure. The fact that you were carrying on your shoulders. Mm. Fear is a great motivator. Fear is a really good thing to have in the back of your mind. And I think um, I think when you lose fear, if you lose a, if you lose a sense of fear, you're going to lose a great motivator to push yourself because it is, it is I mean it is fear of making a bad movie. Um, it would be and, and obviously in this particular case, you know, we had a lot riding on it with the fact that New Line had invested in the three movies at the same time before the first one was released. So that that failure would have been that would have been a train wreck uh, um, if the, that first movie hadn't worked. It would have been the end of a lot of careers, mine and other people's. Um, so, you know, I, I think fear is a healthy thing when you're, because otherwise, what's the alternative to fear? You know, you're overly confident, you're complacent. You sort of, somehow you don't care anymore. So, no, None I don't of those know. words describe Peter Jackson. No, no, I'm happy to be driven by fear. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Pleasure to have you here. Thank you. Peter Jackson, director of the Academy Award nominated film Lord of the Rings, The Return of the King, also nominated for Best Director. We're in Los Angeles, California. Thank you for joining us.